Over the past five years, we have tried out a variety of different heating and cooling options for our short-term rental property that doesn't have AC or heating. Yeah, this is a beach house in San Diego and historically most homes didn't have AC or heating that were right next to the beach, something you're only seeing in new construction. But with every new option we tried, we just found more headaches. Some were too expensive to operate. Others were big and bulky and still left guests feeling uncomfortably warm during the hottest time of the year. What's up guys, I'm Steven. And I'm Kylie. And today we're going to talk AC and heating solutions for your short-term rental property or maybe even your own home. This video is for you if you don't have ductwork in your house and a typical furnace and AC condenser system. Or if you do have existing ductwork, but maybe your system is old and inefficient, costly to replace, and you're looking for a more efficient solution. We'll cover all the alternative choices to typical forced air systems and give you some ratings and recommendations based on our experience. Just a little word of warning, this video is going to be a little bit more technical than some of our others, but we don't want that to scare you off. I'm still learning all of this myself. It's not something that I have any history in, so I made sure when we were putting this video together that everything was broken down in a way that us non-engineers can understand. So stick with us and you'll get a basic but strong understanding of what your options are and you can go away making the best choice for your space. The options that we're going to be discussing today are all in a DIY capacity of some sort, but even if you do choose to hire out this job, it's still really important for you to understand kind of the why behind it all. One, because you don't want to get into a situation where you're maybe being taken advantage of or being upsold on things that you don't necessarily need. And two, you should be choosing the right method that's best for the long term, not just the one that's cheapest to install up front. Installation cost and the complexity level of the installation are both going to be important factors that we'll be discussing for each option today. But the biggest thing, especially for us being in the Southwest where electricity rates are high, efficiency is also going to be very important. Choosing an inefficient solution could cost you hundreds or even thousands of dollars over the life of the unit. So putting a little thought into your solution up front is important. Ready to take some notes? Ready to teach us? Let's go. <laughs> you sure seem to have a lot of information. Option one is a portable AC unit. A portable AC unit is basically a unit on wheels, self-contained. They're about the size of like a big rolling suitcase with the big tube out the back that forces hot air out the window. For ease of install, we're gonna rate these five out of five. It's really just as simple as putting the unit in the room you want to cool and running that hose to the nearest window. They come with kits that can adapt to different window types that keep the hose securely in the window. No specialized skills are required to figure this out. For power consumption, we're rating these a one out of five. Portable AC unit are the least efficient of the three methods that we're going to be comparing today. Yeah, and to talk about efficiency and comparisons, you really have to look at the energy efficiency ratio or the EER. You'll also see terms like SEER and CEER. Those are a little too far in depth to explain in this video, but the gist here is that there's an energy efficiency ratio that all units are rated on. That's the best way to make comparisons of your operating costs. Those ratings are all derived from taking the cooling capacity, which is in the US expressed in BTUs per hour, divided by the power consumption in watts. That's science, so that's true. Don't click away yet. I know that sounds like a lot of information. We're gonna break it down. You'll have it handled, don't worry. A lower EER means lower efficiency and higher power consumption. So for these portable AC units, you're typically going to see a range of EER between 7.5 and 14. You're gonna have to pay a lot to get to the top of this range. The most typical rating you're gonna find is around eight. And also you'll find the cooling capacity of most of these units is around 8,000 BTUs per hour. This example makes our cost calculation very easy. So you're going to take that cooling ratio, which in our example is 8,000 BTU per hour, and you're going to divide it by the EER, which in this example is eight. 8,000 divided by eight is 1,000. So this unit consumes 1,000 watts or one kilowatt while it's running. Utilities bill in a price per kilowatt hour, which means that you pay X amount for every one kilowatt per hour that you're using. And in California, the average price per kilowatt hour is 31 cents. Let's say you have a guest in the house and they run the system for 15 hours. This portable AC unit would consume 15 kilowatt hours of energy. Those 15 kilowatt hours would cost you $4.65 per day or around $140 per month. 
So that's the operating cost. What about the cost to buy it? On average for an 8,000 BTU portable unit, you're going to spend around $300. You can spend over $500 on another unit with a higher EER rating. And remember, high EER means more efficient, means less cost to run. And now you know the math equation to calculate your kilowatt per hour usage rate. Per hour divided by the EER divided by 1,000 equals your consumption in kilowatts. Then you look at what your utility charges per kilowatt hour, think of how much time your unit might be used per day, and calculate your usage cost. Now let's talk pros and cons of choosing a portable AC unit. The main one here is that they're easy to set up and just as easy to take down. When we had one of these portable AC units, it was in our beach house and we obviously didn't need it in the winter time. It was getting pretty chilly. So because it took up so much floor space, we would move it to the garage once the temps cool down. They're also simple to use. Some have remotes, others just have a temperature display and a few buttons on the top. Anyone can figure out how to set this to make the room cool. And the cons, the biggest one is energy efficiency. These portable units are the least efficient of the three that we're going to be covering today and therefore the most expensive to operate. Another consideration that may apply to you is heating. These portable AC units don't have a heating capacity so if you are in an area where it's going to be cold in the winter and you don't have central heat then you probably are going to need to supplement with the space heater or something like that. And those are really inefficient. Very inefficient. If you are going to go space heater route I guess we should talk about this. Radiant ones are the most efficient. Better than that. I've learned that. Yeah the resistive types that just blow it hot air over a coil like a hairdryer. Go out the space heater! Get away from the space heater! Then there is a general inability for you to monitor them remotely. Wi-Fi capability is uncommon, and if you do want to buy it, it's probably going to cost you. We do like the Wi-Fi capability. Sometimes we like to be able to cool down the house if the house has been empty and we have a guest coming that day, or to make sure that the systems aren't being abused. And the last con for portable units is they're loud. If you put one in a bedroom, not everyone's going to like that loud noise pretty close to where they're sleeping. Oh, and they're they're kind of an eyesore. They're pretty big too. They take up a lot of floor space. Design. They don't. They're not. They're not aesthetic. I mean, it's symbiotic. No. Um, that's just the air condition. Alternative number two is a window AC unit. I think everyone knows what these are, but basically they are a self-contained unit that you place inside of a window and plug into a wall. For ease of install, we're going to rate these a 4 out of 5 because they're a bit more complex than a portable unit, but still pretty easy to get done. If you decide to install one of these window units yourself, the most important thing is not to let it fall out the window. Don't do that. Conditioner! Most units come with some kind of bracketry to hold them in the windowsill and then some kind of like side covers to seal up the gaps between the unit and the edge of your window. For power consumption, we're rating these a two out of five. Remember the EER rating we talked about with the portables. Remember that a higher EER is a more efficient unit. We talked about how the EERs for a portable AC unit are typically going to range from 7.5 to 14 with most of those units falling in at eight. Well, the EER for window units is going to fall between a range of nine to 15 with most of those units coming in at 10. And you're going to find the same 8,000 BTU per hour cooling capacity. So we can run the same calculation comparison again. We can plug our numbers into the formula. 8,000 BTU per hour divided by an EER of 10 is going to give us a consumption of 800 watts or 0.8 kilowatts. If it was run 15 hours a day, you consume 12 kilowatt hours. And in California, that cost would be $3.72 a day or around $111 per month. Which is about a $30 savings compared to the portable AC unit in our first example. So that's the operating costs. What about the cost to buy one? An 8,000 BTU per hour window unit can be picked up for less than $250. You can pay upwards of 500 or more for units that have heating capability or are at the top end of that EER ratio. Higher EER, more efficient, lower operating costs. You got it, right? Yeah. Beginning to understand what's going on here. Pros for choosing a window AC unit? Window ACs can be installed with very basic tools. Sometimes it's nice to have an extra set of hands when placing it in the window. Don't let that thing drop. They're also easy to remove if you don't want to use them year round. Also, Wi-Fi connectivity is pretty common with window AC units, so you most likely are going to have the ability to control them remotely. The cons, they're still pretty inefficient and therefore expensive to run. And they're loud. Heating capability is also pretty uncommon, so you're probably gonna need space heaters. 
at least at the beach we did. And speaking of the beach, as far as longevity, you are going to get less of a lifespan of these in salty air climates. They tend to corrode the units. We are saying a lifespan of about three years right now. All right, so this brings us to option number three, a mini split, which is our favorite. A mini split is a two-part system with no ductwork. It does have an indoor and an outdoor component, like a typical kind of furnace heat exchanger and condenser system. But the no ductwork requirement is a game changer when you're trying to add cooling and heating to a property. We're gonna give the mini splits an install rating of two out of five. Yeah, the install here is definitely more involved than a portable AC unit or a window unit. It does require some handy skills and the patience to follow a procedure to the letter, but I've done three units now, and the last one I did, I was feeling pretty comfortable with it, and I did it in less than four hours from start to finish. We're going to talk in a minute about two different options that you can consider if you're going the DIY mini split install route, and you might be surprised about the recommendation that we're gonna give. For power consumption, we're rating the mini splits a five out of five. Power consumption is where mini splits shine. Remember the EER from the previous examples, eight is typical for the portable AC, 10 is typical for the window unit. The mini splits we've installed all have an EER of between 20 and 22. The last one I did had a rating of 21. Following our examples and calculations from before with 15 hours of usage, an 8,000 BTU per hour unit would consume about five and a half kilowatt hours. 5.45. So the cost would be $1.68 per day or $50.69 per month. Almost a third of what a portable unit would cost to operate. Not only are these more efficient and less expensive to run than a portable AC and a window unit, they're often even more efficient and less expensive to operate than your typical central AC with a ductwork system. The cost for a mini split unit has a pretty wide range. For 12,000 BTU per hour units, we're seeing costs between $550 and $1,450. And we'll talk about why this is pretty big variance in a minute. So you've probably noticed that when we're comparing these portable units, we're using an 8,000 BTU system. And the 8,000 BTU per hour cooling capacity is common because this is nearing the maximum electrical load that a 15 amp household 120 volt circuit can handle. Meaning if you had a more powerful system, it would consume too much power for your circuit and probably trip breakers. But since mini splits are so much more efficient, you can get a higher cooling capacity on the same electrical circuit. Because of this, the most common size you'll see for mini splits are 12,000 BTUs per hour or a 120 volt electrical circuit. The list of pros for choosing mini split is a long list. The first one being that almost all of them have heating capability, meaning no more space heaters. Most also include Wi-Fi capability for remote monitoring and control. And one of my favorite parts is they're very quiet. When the fan is on a low setting, the air handler in the room is barely audible. Efficiency is another big pro. They're about a third of the cost to operate than a portable unit. And then longevity. These units are a lot more robust than a window unit and should have a lot longer lifespan. The unit we bought for the beach also also has a corrosion resistant coating on the outdoor coils. The cons, the main one is that the install requires some handy skills and more time. They're also more expensive upfront than the other two options. Let's go back to the price variance. And that really comes down to there being two different ways to choose systems that you're gonna install yourself. Basically, you can buy a kit that includes everything you need to install, or you can buy the unit and then piece together all the other materials that you need to do the installation yourself. We're gonna be comparing a Mr. Cool branded system, which is the brand that sells full DIY kits, to every other brand on the market, which is a little bit different. It's basically Mr. Cool versus the rest of the world. Okay, Mr. Cool. It really is. They advertise and sell a DIY kit that includes everything you need. The main differentiator for them is they have refrigerant lines where you don't need to use a vacuum pump to pull air from the refrigerant lines. And the advertising is true. The first unit we bought and installed was a Mr. Cool unit because I was still a little bit intimidated by this line vacuuming process. The kit that they sell really is all inclusive and the process went very smooth, but the drawback here is the price. Today, a 12,000 BTU per hour Mr. Cool system costs about $1,450. Now, this is still a big savings compared to if you were to hire an HVAC contractor and have them come out, you're looking at a cost between three and $5,000. Every other company selling mini splits besides Mr. Cool because of the requirement to vacuum pump the refrigerant lines during the installation process. How refrigeration works can be a big rabbit hole of YouTube videos and engineering concepts, but the general gist here is that it's a hermetically sealed closed loop 
loop system with only refrigerant meant to run through those lines. Air from our atmosphere, dirt, or any other sort of contaminants that get into the refrigeration line can mess up the whole system. So will leaks because that will let air into the system or let the refrigerant out into the atmosphere. So the most critical part of the every other system but Mr. Cool is making sure that all of the air is vacuum pumped out of those lines and making sure that everything is sealed properly. This is already getting long, so it's not gonna be a how to install a mini split video. There are already a handful of extremely helpful YouTube videos on mini split installations. So we will link a few of Steven's favorites in the description box below. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. I watched several videos before tackling this project ourselves. The two main ones that stick out for me are one by Redbeard Engineered and Learn to DIY. So thanks guys for making great content. Let's compare costs of these two different types of DIY mini split installations. To sort of level the playing field, we're going to assume that you already have a fairly complete set of hand tools, a drill, and a hole saw that can cut holes in the side of your house. I also previously had a torque wrench, but then I had to buy crow's feet to fit on the AC fittings. So we'll link those and everything else we're talking about in the video description below. For the Mr. Cool unit that we bought, the cost was $14.50 plus tax. And then we also bought a wall mount to wall mount the unit on the outside of the house. And that was $55. There were a few electrical needs that added up to around $50 and that was it. Total all in cost for that was around $1,555. The latest two units that I've done were not Mr. Cool and they required vacuuming the refrigerant lines. So for that, we had the unit cost at $550, the $55 mount, $50 in electrical needs, a vacuum pump and gauge set for around $120, and a connection sealant at $13. Total cost, $788. It's a significant savings compared to the Mr. Cool, and I can reuse that pump and gauges for future installs that I might do. Or if you're doing this DIY route and you're going to need multiples inside of one house, if you have a larger house, that could exponentially save you as well. After doing the Mr. Cool system, seeing how everything worked, I was confident that I could do the line vacuuming myself and therefore save a good amount of money on future installs. Making good connections with the torque wrench and running your lines is the most critical part. Then hooking up the vacuum and checking for leaks is pretty easy. We also learned that it's really important to plan everything out in advance so that you're not running to Home Depot in the middle of the installation. Multiple times. You're also gonna need to figure out how you're gonna get power to the outdoor unit, where you're gonna put it, is wall mounting the best? Is a ground pad going to work? What is your wall composition like? Are there any special tools needed for? If you had concrete or brick, you might need a rotary hammer drill to, to make holes in that. Otherwise, the basic thing here is if you feel confident, you can replace a sink faucet and you also feel confident that you can replace an electrical outlet or a light fixture, you can do a mini split. You heard it, guys. If you have enough plumbing skills to replace a sink faucet and enough electrical knowledge to replace a ceiling light, you can do it. He says so. I believe in you. Leave us a comment below if you've ever tried something like this before or maybe now you're compelled to try it yourself. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.